Perfect. Yep. You ready? All right. So welcome everyone to the webinar this evening. My name is Dr. Marco Caravaggio. I'm a pediatric and family wellness chiropractor in Markham, Ontario. And tonight I'm going to be interviewing um, somebody who came into my life, I don't know how long ago, maybe a year, a year or two more, I think, and uh, kind of had some interesting things and we had some good connection. I like what he's doing and his name is Lucas and I'll get him to introduce himself and I'll be interviewing him a little bit because he's done some pretty interesting things with his life and he's written a book and he's got a lot of things going on and I think it would be interesting for a lot of people and he could uh, share some insights on something that's uh, often misunderstood in the public and has to get some more um, awareness out there. So go ahead and introduce yourself, Lucas. <clears throat> yes, so my name is Lucas Moffat. Uh, thank you for joining this, this evening, ladies and gentlemen. And yeah, so about myself, I'm a fourth year student at the University of Waterloo. Um, that's at the base. Uh, surrounding that, there's a lot of things going on. I uh, just published a book on Tourette syndrome, which is kind of what this interview is about. And we'll talk about that. Uh, that's the one. <laughs> um, in addition to that, I'm involved in a few different uh, startups. So I have experience working in everything from running a coffee shop to environmental projects. I'm based in South America. Um, technology as well. Uh, that was one of my most recent co-op jobs. I consider myself uh, pretty proficient in technology. Um, and so now kind of next steps looking at merging, especially now, you know, the benefits of healthcare and technology and how um, we can create a solution. Um, so what drove me here is kind of my passion for understanding and learning about basically why people do what they do and what, you know, causes us to act in certain ways. And so for me, that was driven by my own experience with a neurological condition called Tourette syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so Tourette syndrome, there's a lot of, I guess, there's a lot of a lack of clarity, if you will, because there's a lot of information and research, but not all of it is the most cohesive and some uh, may be in disagreement with, you know, other information. And so the journey which I wanted to embark on was really about trying to figure out how we could take these different perspectives um, as well as my own perspective and figure out how we could get that into something that was pract practical, universally available, and that could be put into the hands of people from, you know, any, any background, essentially, you know, whether they're a young child or an older adult. And so once I kind of had that, you know, made that decision, what was next was figuring out, you know, who are the people that are, you know, kind of experts in different fields pertaining to neurology and health and how I can basically get in contact with them to get their perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, so really we can create something that's comprehensive with anecdotal and empirical evidence, which Perfect. is how I ran into Dr. Caravaggio's path. Um, so I, I saw an event uh, hosted by Dr. Caravaggio. Uh, he's a chiropractor. And what I saw was that he, he was doing a lot of things which kind of went beyond the scope of just a traditional straightforward chiropractor in the sense that his knowledge was far beyond that um, of a traditional chiropractor. And so uh, I attended a session on neurological disorders and learned from his insight uh, treating patients and what that looked like. And it was a very positive experience. So fast forward, you know, a year and a half later, and here we are, the book has been published and, you know, so far so good. Um, mm -hmm. And now we're trying to see, you know, who we can you know, help in terms of if there's information. And also I, I'm going to be talking about some of the things I did to, you know, not just overcome the Tourette syndrome and live like an average life, but how to, you know, actually begin to live optimally and reach your full potential um, and how to channel that energy from the Tourette's into, you know, productivity, basically. That's great. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I guess before I get started, like I kind of mentioned, we should probably put the old disclaimer out there before we <laughs> get too deep into Absolutely. the details and stuff. So like I say, I'm not a medical doctor. We're not giving medical advice. I'm just having a conversation with Lucas. I uh, just did my chiropractic for over 20 years now. I've just been interested in neurology in the brain, and we call it like a, a um, sort of a teaching on chiropractic, well, chiropractic functional neurology. I've done lots and lots of courses on you know, autism spectrum, ADHD, and all the different things. And just to kind of get a, just the concept of the brain and how we can kind of uh, do certain approaches to the body that can help sort of bring up certain areas of the brain that might not have the same level of functioning as others and try to balance things out and help the body function more appropriately. And when Lucas came to my uh, the, the seminar at my office, one of the things we always try to get people to understand is that, you know, when I'm doing my work, I'm not trying to treat anything. So people can have 100,000 different conditions and symptoms and stuff. And we're just trying to make the body work the way it's supposed to and improve health. 
So even in Lucas's book, he's got a lot of sections on just, you know, talking about what, what can you do just to be like a healthier person. And, you know, if, even if you have the condition, you want to be as healthy as you can with the condition sort of thing, right? And then what kind of things you can do in your life. And so I just want to put that disclaimer out there. I might be giving some some theories and hypotheses that I might have that don't have any scientific backing, but they're just things I've been reading and stuff and some things that make sense to me as far as the neurology and things like that. I might throw some of those things in there along the way as well. Sound good? So I think um, one of the things, just uh, maybe just give a definition, because a lot of people, you know, I can guarantee 90, 95% of the public, if you ask them what Tourette is, they're probably thinking of the corporal alia thing where somebody's going to be yelling and swearing and obscenity and moving around and, you know, flicking and stuff. But we know that that's probably maybe about 10% of the people that actually have it, have that, correct? So um, can you just give just an idea of, you know, people who don't know what it is, how would you define it? And what is the definition if you want to get into that? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So I'll start off by saying, I mean, the definition, you know, uh, take this with a grain of salt because it varies for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. But generally from my experience and working with people with the condition and doctors, um, what we say to Red Syndrome is it's basically it's a condition where essentially you have, it's a combination of kind of this urge to do something, this discomfort, um, this decreased inhibition, and kind of in combination with some sort of outlet, right? So um, for the way I describe it, kind of what the complex of, you know, when a tick is about to kind of occur, when it's manifesting, and then when it's actually released and performed, um, it's, it's an interesting process. But I kind of like to liken it to something like a mosquito bite, um, in the sense that when you get a mosquito bite, you know, you notice there's a spot on your arm, you may itch it, and you feel that sense of relief, right? But when you stop itching it, there's kind of something in the back of your head going like, man, like I should probably scratch that, like, because, you know, it's going to relieve that, relieve this discomfort. Um, unfortunately, with, with the ticks, um, they never stop. So with the mosquito bite, there's this kind of forced stop on how long you can scratch it. You scratch it long enough and it will start to bleed. And that's, you know, kind of a very, you know, physical sign that, hey, I've probably, you know, maxed out on scratching this area. <laughs> um, but with the ticks, after you, you know, actually, you know, perform that tick or scratch that bite, if you will, um, generally the, the relief isn't there. And it's kind of an inverse relation in some sense where, you know, when you begin to tick, it will almost trigger more ticks. And so it can get in this like cycle. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to get out of that when you're in the middle of one. But um, learning to step away from kind of that cycle and understanding why you perform certain behaviors um, is really important. So Tourette syndrome isn't just, you know, ticks. Uh, the statistics vary depending on what scholarly sources you look at, right? Uh, generally, they say upwards of 60%, 60 to 80% of people with Tourette syndrome will have a comorbid or like another additional disorder. Yeah. Um, so for many people, um, common ones like for myself include ADHD, OCD. Yeah. Um, there you'll also find varied uh, perspectives on what they classify Tourette syndrome as. Some people list it as part of the spectrum disorder. Um, so it's on the spectrum with autism and ADHD and OCD. And um, some scientists will say that they kind of liken it to the manifestation of that performance, right? So yeah. um, there's different neurological kind of Essentially, it's a malfunctioning at the, or it appears to be, and you know the combination of our environment, our diet, our behaviors, our habits all influence what that looks like over a long period of time. Right. Um, so yeah, I also have a diagnosis of ADHD and OCD, um, mm -hmm. which helps kind of bring perspective to the Tourette syndrome information I try to provide. Yeah. And yeah, so I think. And so with Tourette's basically, but they kind of have to say you should have a motor and a vocal tick pretty much, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I should mention that's a great yeah. point. Yeah. So um, to kind of move from what they call it, just a tick disorder to actual Tourette syndrome, uh, the presence of both the motor and the vocal tick are required for at least a year. And generally they say it starts before the age of 12 years old ish. Um, the age when I was diagnosed was around 10. Um, now people, kids are getting diagnosed at an earlier age because, um, you know, from the experience physicians have, they're able to identify um, yeah. earlier and more efficiently. Right. And, and a couple of things I want to point out to some people a lot, because I deal a lot with like, you know, spectrum kids and things <clears> like that. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times it always gets mis- um, 
and misinterpret it as the kid acting out or being misbehaving on purpose. <laughs> and I always kind of get people to understand that it is, it's not, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's an automatic thing and you know, you have to work on it. To, like, you know, if somebody's looking at you right now, people wouldn't even know you have it, right? Like, if you exactly. Know, maybe somebody might pick up like an extra blink or something like that, but that, that's about it, right? <laughs> so you, you've done a pretty good job, but like if people didn't know you had it, they wouldn't even, just by watching this, most people wouldn't even be aware, right? Um, so like, I, just, just it's an important thing to understand that sometimes when neurons are firing, if the pathways aren't worked the way they properly, and there's a lot of this thing called inhibition, like most of your brain is just trying to stop stuff from happening. <laughs> there's like a general thing, but a lot, there's a lot of pathways in your brain that are just inhibiting, inhibiting, inhibiting. Okay, we'll let that go now sort of thing. But when the inhibitory <laughs> pathways don't work or they're not wired properly, and all of a sudden things are going that shouldn't be going, and then you have this kind of stuff. But it's not, there's a lot of automaticness to it. Like it's not like the kid is doing it to misbehave and you know, all these kids that are misbehaving or whatever, they, they really, you know, they want their love of their parents and they want to be accepted and all that stuff. And uh, so just go back, because I know I read your story and when you first, I can remember how old you were, but I think you're five or seven or something like that when you were in the pool. So just give me that sort of, you know, the, 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 the pool story and tell the people about when it first happened to you and what it felt like. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, the famous pool. Um, <laughs> So when I, I mean, so from a young age, I mean, I kind of realized there's something, you know, uh, different, maybe unique about me. I never, you know, I don't even think I had the ability to understand whether it was good or bad or what it was. Um, but around the age of seven years old, uh, that began to change. Uh, so I was at a pool, like a fam, one of those uh, like local family pool kind of things. Mm -hmm. And we we're swimming. It was a normal day. And I don't know what happened that day that caused this to all of a sudden be like, you know, the process of my, you know, thoughts or patterns. Um, but I was swimming and when I was swimming, it was a short, it was in the shallow end. So my top half of the body was above water and my bottom half, you know, was below the water. And basically I was just swimming and I went to put my foot down and in the pool, there's these, you know, square tiles and between the tiles, there's this grout and the tiles are very smooth. Uh, but the grout, um, if you don't know, is kind of rough and it's a different texture. And so the way my foot hit the ground, it like hit both at the same time It hit the tile and then it hit the grout. And I'm, as soon as it hit the grout, it was like, it was almost like I just like stepped on a nail or something the way like uh, my body and not really my body per se, but I guess my mind reacted. Um, because when I, my foot touched that tile, it was like, all these alarms went off and something, you know, there was this imbalance, something, you know, needed to be fixed immediately. And I don't know what drove that. It was my intuition or something because the, the way my body just determined at that point to fix this imbalance was to go down and touch the grout with my hand. Mm -hmm. And you know, it doesn't really make sense. And that's, you know, that's what the scientists are still trying to figure out and the physicians to this day. Yeah. Um, but I realized at that point, you know, something was kind of different. And my dad noticed right away um, and said, you know, wh what was that about? Why did you kind of just dive into the pool like that? Yeah. And at the time, I didn't really have an explanation that I thought would be valid. So I just said, like, I needed a boost. <laughs> right. Um, kind of get myself out of the water. And he said, okay. Um, and it kind of went on. And mm -hmm. from there, that's when the takes really began to kind of manifest themselves in more visible ways. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to even mention, like right now, for example, you can only see my face, which is good because uh, some of the ticks, for example, like I might tap my finger, or I might kind of, you know, um, play with my hands, um, things like that, where yeah. you, there is the energy being released and the central nervous system is being stimulated in the correct way. But as the audience, you can't see it because I chose to direct that kind of energy in that regard as the outlet. Um, and so from there in class, I began this squeaking sound. It was like, mm, mm, and a lot of clearing of the throat. <clears throat> so they thought I had asthma, maybe allergies. I was tested for allergies. Um, they took, took all those needles and stuck them in my back and, you know, determined which spots, you know, were having allergic reactions. I then had an, an asthma inhaler. So the uh, puffers, as they called them. And it helped a little bit, the puffer, because, you know, I think my airways were clear. But overall, there was no real change. And in fact, it started to get worse. And um, it got to a point where I was getting kicked out of class quite frequently, not just for the tics. I mean, the behavior itself, but it was largely the tics um, because I'd be making noises. I started doing a tick where I would laugh instead of make the squeak. 
um, because it was kind of more casual. And from there, that's really when it started because pretty much every time I'd laugh, they'd think I was fooling around and I'd get kicked out of class. And it was like, now what? You know, what do I do from here? Um, So I think that kind of explains like part of, you know, my story. Yeah, that's um, good. Misperceptions of it. That 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 thing sometimes like we we call it like a sensory trick. So you know the 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 contact on your foot, you had to go put your hand on it, right? So we we often we notice sometimes like people might they might put their hand in front of their face or do something like that, like touch something just to send a different input into the nerve system that maybe might help an inhibitory pathway prevent the thing from happening, right? So like you know you touching your hand, that kind of thing. And so over your your kind of life, you know, going to the different um, Dr. Doran and McKinley and all that kind of stuff, you kind of learn some strategies to kind of, like you say, you're, you're, it's still kind of happening, but you're sort of redirecting it so it's not really so obvious to the public sort of thing, right? So mm-hmm. what, what kind of steps did you sort of take or what, what kind of things do you do right now, actually, to kind of, you know, make it look less obvious, I guess? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I think um, in terms of like the largest differences, for me, my preference really comes out of a preference for functionality and results, right? So I say to people all the time, like my Tourette's aren't the problem, it's the environment in which the Tourette's occur in. Um, yeah. So if I'm in a classroom and I'm ticking, then obviously that's going to be noticeable. So the biggest part really is the lifestyle. I'd say it's not a quick fix. Um, there's a few key solutions and kind of aspects. So start off with, for me, um, what I noticed, if I am not like doing anything in the day, like if I'm kind of bored um, or even just like, you know, um, not using all of my energy in the day, that's kind of when the ticks start to, you know, occur. So just even as a whole, keeping myself busy, having a healthy diet and constantly learning, I think is the biggest thing I've learned. I had some different strategies, which were like included physical activity. Um, I've always been a big fan and advocate for physical activity and the benefits it can make physically and cognitively, um, as well as the diet. Um, One of the things Dr. Caravaggio talked to me about, which actually I, you know, used myself and found it effective was this type of fish oil. Um which has unique properties, which has been helpful for myself. Um, But right now, the day-to-day, I'd say, in terms of what helps me most, it's a combination of learning and physical activity. And really, if I don't learn enough or I don't do enough physical activity, at the end of the day, I notice, like, there's something not right here. Um, And and this is the case in many uh, disorders. They notice in people who have dyslexia um, that there's a region in their brain. I believe it's the left uh, planum temporal. And uh, they actually, when they do the fMRI scans, it's actually smaller than a person without dyslexia. But what they saw is over time, when you give that person like, you know, lots of readings and different ways to stimulate the mind, that region in the brain actually increases in size, corresponding to an increase in function and strength. Yeah. Um, so, I'd, and the other thing is I'd say, you know, your habits and your actions, right? So what you believe, coming to a sense of self-acceptance, and trying to figure out, you know, what are the positive ways to channel your energy kind of in all circumstances, right? Yeah. Um, it's easy to get caught up in, you know, the whole thing and, you know, just focus on the negative. Right. Um, that, right. That's definitely, you know, and I felt that for a long time. Um, but what I realized, and I wish I knew it sooner, was just as simple of a change as having a positive attitude, being optimistic all the time. Um, you know, and even if you're, if you're going to do one, like all in or all out, I'd say be optimistic and be positive because it will get you in better, you know, situations and better outcomes than the contrary of, you know, being negative sure. all the time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So just a couple of things. So it wasn't, it's not official. oil. It's a, it's a seal oil, right? Mammalian, if you remember that, <laughs> the oil, <laughs> just with that one correction, it's called Ohm. Is there- My apologies. Yeah, mammalian seal oil. That's the one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Bit of a difference in that one. And um, so a couple of things um, with uh, with with just kind of maintaining two, uh, let me two ideas. So number one, physical activity. So um, I, I think you like bas- basketball. That's one of your big things, or right? you do stuff like that. And it's a, it's a really good important outlet. Like let's say, let's say there's a parent that just newly discovers their kid has Tourette's. A couple of things to think in mind. Like during the day. They might be trying to suppress it at school if they can think about suppressing it but then if they do that then it'll come back really really heavy when they get home or it'll be even worse when they're when they finally can let go that happens often correct and, and so the other thing the parents should be aware of is maybe not not getting the kid to do something right away when they get home they're, they got they need to decompress somehow so what kind of strategies would you give a parent maybe that maybe it's just learning the kid has Tourette's so they're just kind of understanding <laughs> how with if they have a kid in that what would you recommend to them 
Yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so this actually, it was kind of funny because I was volunteering at a Tourette syndrome clinic at the time where this came to light because there was one, you know, one patient who was going to the clinic and after school, his symptoms were really, really bad. And there was a lot of, you know, concerns from the parent perspective. And when we, when the questions were, you know, began being asked, one of the biggest things right away was, yeah, he comes home from school and then he has to do two and a half hours of chores right away. And it was almost like, well, of course he's going to have terrible tics. I mean, he's holding it in. So it's like he's under eight hours of trying to keep this thing locked in and he's finally ready to let it out. And then it's like, okay, now more work. And it's kind of like you look at it as like a beaker in a sense where, you know, you can get to the halfway point and then at the full way point it starts to overflow. Mm -hmm. And so for people with Tourette syndrome, you know, think of their beaker kind of being, you know, constantly half full or at the 90% mark where, especially if they come home from school. And I'd say really kind of try and, you know, understand what they're feeling. A lot of times they'll have a lot of thoughts or a lot of feelings going on, you know, especially after school when they're trying to release their tics. So give them some time, give them some, you know, basically give them a, I mean, obviously it depends on your child, but generally give them their own personal space, right? So that they can do something they would like to do or enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's for half an hour, an hour, it really depends on, the, you know, the person. And then, you know, if the chores need to be done, that's okay at some point, right? The chores have to be done. Um, but see, you know, maybe if they can do an hour now, an hour later, and in the meantime, they can watch TV or maybe they have homework. Um, but trying to create that balance. I mean, if for them, it can be kind of like there's the scale and they always feel like it's tipped on the wrong side. Um, yeah. So you have to kind of approach that situation thinking like, you know, this person is going to be not in the best mood. You know, how can I help them? you know, be successful and achieve the goals we both want, but also, you know, keeping that in mind so that we can have a positive environment. Um, yeah. And that's really it. I mean, yeah, I think trying to foster a sense of positivity and kind of, you know, giving them the, that ability to make the decision. And from there, positive things generally happen. That's right. Excellent. Cool. And so just um, like from our neurology kind of framework of it, like you were describing, you, know, you said that there's dyslexia, usually there's a left brain. So we kind of, the way we kind of look at it in our functional neurology stuff, we kind of look at the functionality, right brain, left brain, and a lot of the comorbidities um, with the, the whole Tourette's, if you want to put it in the spectrum, we kind of say typically the right side of your brain will put the brakes on your body and, and prevent things or slow things from happening. And the left side would make things go sort of thing. And we typically say, you know, we have a Ferrari engine on the left side and we have bicycle brakes on the right side. So things are going all the time, but the brakes aren't happening. And that's why stuff is going all the time. And so like the way I kind of look at it is, you know, the, the whole spectrum, there can be a lot of comorbidities because generally when the right brain is negatively impacted by whatever it is that happens in youth, depending on how big it is and how what spots on the right side, it'll cause different things. It might just cause like a high functioning, um, you know, Asperger person, or it might cause, if it's maybe affecting basal ganglia and some connections in there, then it might be causing like a tick thing or a Tourette thing. And but because the right side is generally affected a lot of different parts, then those comorbidities might all come together because it's generally a, a right brain kind of problem. And some of the things I might look at, you know, somebody if the right hemisphere is not working as good, then um, you know this side is controlling. Uh, we call it motor control on the left side of my body, but involuntary stuff on this side. And usually the brain is inhibiting things in the body, but when it doesn't inhibit things, this muscle here, for example, the sternocleidomastoid might get tighter and cause the person to have a right head tilt. And we might look at their eyes and say, you know, one, pu one pupil is not constricted. We know when you're calm, your pupils are pretty small because you're relaxed, but when you're in fight or flight, it might be bigger. So if one side is not working and not inhibiting, it might look like a bigger pupil on one side compared to the other and things like that we might be looking at. And um, <clears throat> a lot of times the, the connectivity is an interesting thing too, because, um, you know, typically, you know, for a normal functioning brain, there's a lot of like overlap, cross crawling, cross uh, pollination and talking before things happen. But with the, with the autism spectrum, we kind of say some parts are like underconnected and other parts are overconnected. So I always say that they're almost always like a genius activity. Like they might do, they might be super awesome at doing something that be a left brain activity, like putting things in order, sizing things up and, you know, some, some sort of thing on the left brain. But then the right brain would be more emotional stuff. So we kind of say emotional quotient is on the right brain. Intelligence quotient is on the left brain. So the right brain would be setting up a lot of things like, you know, how to behave in public, how to act, how to interact with people, understanding body language. And then left side is where you get your intellectual intelligence and learning how to do math and reading and talking and that kind of thing. 
And so when the right side gets compromised, then those kind of things might show up as, you know, challenges with uh, socialization and that kind of stuff. And that can always be a big thing too. Um, and so I, I know like um, a lot of times, I know with somebody like with Tourette's or any kind of condition, they're always, I don't want to say they're, they want to make an excuse for it, but like you said, when you went down and had to touch the water and you, when you came up, you had to kind of like make up a story for your dad to make it seem real, <laughs> like make, make sense to him. So, um, just can can you give any sort of like uh, a lot of there's an important thing of being able to accept yourself and understanding that it's okay like you, you talked about it in the book that there was a certain point where you said well it's not really like a bad thing that I have this now how, how did you kind of come to that sort of change in your thought process on like it's not such a bad thing for me it's actually kind of like a gift in a certain way yeah absolutely I mean uh, there was two key developments um, really that kind of began catalyzing that change in perspectives on um, the first, you know, the first being when at the time uh, when I was in grade 10, I was fortunate enough to see a psychologist named Dr. Duncan McKinley. And at that point, I hadn't met anybody else with, with the condition. And so for me, it was always very confusing. Uh, I went to different doctors across Ontario, across Canada, and nobody really had any sort of answers. And no, but there was no models which I could look at, you know, or frameworks and see, okay, like frameworks for success. And yeah. when I met Dr. McKinley and his, his vocal tics were significantly worse than mine. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, that was kind of the trademark of him. I could, I could kind of hear him uh, coming down yeah, the hall. Down the hall right? um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was kind of at that point where I saw him like, you know, the Dr. McKinley you know, with Tourette syndrome. And it was like, Huh, I, because at that point I hadn't even thought anything like that was even possible for somebody with this disorder, and there, there it was, very in front of my eyes, kind of saying mm -hmm. otherwise. And yeah, it really, it was kind of like a light bulb went off in my head. Something changed, which made me realize, like you know, if he can do it with this condition, my condition is not an excuse to not be able to do it. Um, and so in that point, then the onus then fell on me rather than the condition. And at that point, I had to begin to accept and understand, well, okay, if this is how I am, if this is, you know, what I'll be facing, what are the things that can turn this negative into a positive, essentially? Um, so one of the things about uh, having Tourette's syndrome and ADHD is I have a lot of energy generally. Uh, so probably a lot of parents will see the, the kids with ADHD, they have trouble sleeping at the, in the evenings, um, sitting still. So really figuring out ways that you can optimize that energy into productive means. And that was a huge one because uh, for most people with Tourette's syndrome, they'll find a similar thing. Um, the only time their symptoms kind of stop is when they're doing something that they kind of really enjoy that kind of uses like their cognitive like space, yeah. like their <laughs> tools essentially. Uh, so for me, when I played basketball, it was like everything stopped. It was, I was in this zone of yeah. flow, like my Tourette syndrome wasn't even in the equation. It was yeah. just basketball, you know, um, what was the next play? And so from there, um, even beyond just, you know, trying to get better, it was basketball became kind of like a sanctuary and outlet where, you know, I knew this was going to help. So I did it. And then I was playing competitive basketball at the time. Uh, I was playing AAU, so we played actually internationally as well in tournaments in like Pennsylvania at the time. And uh, that's when I realized like, hey, you know, this, this energy thing isn't too bad um, if I, I can use it at the right, you know, in the right means. So um, I began practicing basketball for three, four hours a day. And my skills increased drastically. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was, you know, when I was facing the competition, I realized like, hey, you know, over this one year, I made this improvement. Um, and after getting into university, and I'd like to preface this too, because, you know, although now I'm an honors dean's list student, um, pre-med student, I was never like an academic guy growing up. <laughs> um, so I'd also like to say that's, you know, that's a good thing because, uh, you know, if you, you don't think your kids are, you know, taking a keen interest in books or school, um, I never read as a kid and I just wrote a book. So don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, basically the physical activity and the discipline, the discipline I learned from that physical activity um, was definitely like one of the most important kind of skills, um, and transferable skills, because then when I got into university and I didn't have all the time uh, to play basketball, um, I still had that discipline and that mindset where I was able to, you know, uh, apply apply that discipline to studying for three, four hours at a time rather than, you know, playing basketball. But the outcome was the same. When I was learning interesting facts, every, everything kind of stopped for a minute. It was just the information in front of me. And that kind of fostered that 
you know, passion and really drive to learn as much as I could because, I mean, it's always good to learn. But when it, it's like the only time this thing that's bothering you 24-7 stops is when you're learning, it's like, well, you know, I'm going to do that as much as I can. Um, <laughs> so I'd say that's another thing. And it takes, it's not like, you know, you can just all of a sudden, I'm going to read 20 books a day. But, you know, you kind of get introduce you know, the concept, get familiar and with the right support mechanisms and environment, things I'd say organically will flourish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. And so just um, one one's concept just to kind of help people, like if somebody has Tourette's and they're thinking, well, how can I kind of, man I don't want to say manage it better, but just um, you talk about doing substitutions, right? Can you just talk about that briefly? Like, Because a lot of people, they, they might not know this is something they could possibly do to make it kind of, you know, quote unquote, look better to the general public sort of thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, so <clears throat> substitutions is a big one. I mean, um, in general, this, I mean, the substitutions, they can be done for your own sake or for the sake of, you know, and which is why I did them for basically n not causing disruption and kind of blending in with the rest of the class. Um, so for me, I quickly learned that there was other ways which I could kind of release that discomfort or scratch that itch in a sense where it wasn't going to be so obvious. Um, so when I was younger, I used to be throat clearing, laughing, um, even squeaking sounds where from there I've kind of learned how to transform them and have that outlet in physical activities. So, um, tapping of the finger, um, which I think, and sometimes even I'll just kind of, you know, pinch my fingers like that together. Okay. Um, and as you know, weird as that or illogical may sound, it's because the fingers are like the nerve endings. So there's actually a lot of stimulation, which occurs when you do that. Yeah. Um, and if you move two fingers, I mean, it doesn't make a sound, but you can get that same stimulus kind of going to the brain. And when you do it for long enough, the ticks kind of substitute themselves because the other thing, which is kind of unfortunate is the more you do the tick perform that action, the more your body is primed to do that action. And you kind of reinforce yourself doing this unintended behavior, um, which you know, with Tourette's, that's just part of the package. So kind of transforming that into, yeah. yeah. That, that that's a big thing too because um you know we almost it's almost like a we thought there's a whole term of neuroplasticity right like we say neurons that fire together wire together so the more you use them the more they get used to using them and then they get super efficient at doing it so if you have this tick so like you say that's actually a good one because like there's a thing in the brain called the homunculus which is like a representation of how many how much nerves in that part of your brain are dedicated to a body part and the, the fingers are a huge representation. And the other one is the tongue. And I know a lot of times people have like a tongue picks that, you know, it's in their mouth, you don't really notice it, but it might be, you know, going up to the roof of their tongue or that kind of thing. So substituting another sort of large representation thing, like, you know, the lips or something like that, you know, even just doing like something like that might be like a sensory thing that might not look, you know, too weird. <laughs> it might be instead of, you know, maybe, you know, flailing a hand or something like that, right? But that that's kind of an interesting one, you know, pressure, fingers, touching, that kind of thing. That's interesting. And um, so that, that's pretty good so far. So uh, give me an idea about the uh, the, the book. Um, what, what gave you the idea to write the book and how long did it take? And now that it's out, tell us a bit about the name of it and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the book, the idea to write the book um, kind of came organically through exploring the problem. So I knew I wanted to create some sort of resource that, that could help provide useful information and kind of a framework for learning to live with this condition, not just living with it, but really, you know, thriving and reaching your full potential. And so I was volunteering for a clinic at the time and uh, basically I was trying to figure out what is going to be the best way to get this information to the people who need it most. Um, and I considered mobile applications, website blogs, but the thing about books is, is really that they're accessible to anybody. Um, it was, I, you know, that's part of the reason why I chose to write in a way where I say it could be understood by a smart 10 year old. Um, it is, it does have some academic aspects, but it's kind of general writing. Um, and when I was speaking to kind of stakeholders in the space, they're like, yeah, a book would be great. Um, and then that's when I reached out to Dr. Duncan McKinley, who kind of wrote the last book that was kind of similar, written from somebody with the experience. And yeah. he wrote it in 2008, I believe. And it was a great book. I mean, it's still a great book. Um, but the thing is just some things have been, you know, new information has been discovered and also just kind of creating something that has because everybody with Tourette's syndrome is different. So creating something that's a bit, you know, more modern. And so after I kind of came to that idea, 
it was really a matter of, okay, what's next? Because I'd never written a book before. So, um, yeah, I had no idea where to start. So I was fortunate enough to be put in touch with uh, my editor, Susan Fish, uh, who was part of the incubator program. And I basically just asked her, like, hey, I have this. I know it's a crazy idea, but do you think this is at all possible? And she looked at me and she's like, yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to edit, edit it for you. I was like, oh, okay. So at that point, it was like, I looked at it whether, you know, if I wrote this book and it sucked, whatever, then I'd be in, at the very least, you know, there'd be no loss. It'd, I'd be in the same position. Whereas, you know, if it went well, um, then, you know, who knows where it would go. Um, so yeah. fortunately, it did go well. Um, it, from that point, from kind of talking about it, it was October 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and so I explored the problem more, attended some conferences, including at the Cornell Medical Center in New York. And from there, I kind of developed uh, enough information and also began developing the connections, you know, with Dr. Caravaggio, as well as Dr. Morton Doran and Dr. McKinley. Um, Dr. Morton Doran, he's a retired surgeon with Tourette syndrome and a member of the Order of Canada. And so I was fortunate enough to speak with him and get his insight. Um, and so with, you know, these three kind of experts in kind of various fields provide a great compliment. Then I basically spent about the next 10 months uh, working on it. Uh, the first six months, they were long, but the next four months were much longer. Um, <laughs> the, re the reason for that was because uh, I was fortunate enough to receive funding from the university to write the book. But when you apply for that funding, you have to apply with timelines and key accomplishments. And basically, I made, you know, I said I'd have it done for this date. And so I had to do that. And so it definitely took a lot of work. Um, it takes a while to write a book, but for sure. I'd say it's definitely possible for anybody who is interested in it or kind of thinking about it for sure. Especially now, if you have the opportunity to be at home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's the book. So just tell everybody what it's called and where they can get it. Yeah, so the book is called TikTok Go, um, Overcoming Tourette Syndrome. It's available on my website, tiktokgo.shop. That's T-I-C-T-O-C-G-O dot S-H-O-P. It's $24.99. Um, and yeah, it will ship pretty quickly, I think. It, all the orders are fulfilled through Shopify, so it's uh, pretty. I've had no problems with it so far. That's great. Um, that's, it's been great. And it was, you know, I read it, like I read um, Dr. McKinley's book and I read yours too. And I mean, reading yours is pretty, it's pretty easy read and it's, you know, went through pretty quickly and it was a good read and it was interesting as I was going along. I was thinking the whole time if it was somebody who didn't, wasn't interested in it like I am, but just like the average person, they, they would still get a lot of insight from it for sure. And that's good. And you even, I was even able to give you a little bit, that's me. Hey. <laughs> And so, so. Yeah, like I said, I don't treat it, but I just have some insights on brain health and that kind of thing. So maybe we'll just kind of throw in a couple of those little things. So um, just asking about, you know, how to keep your brain healthy and things like that. Um, yeah, Doc, I was going to say to add in there, yeah, like Dr. Caravaggio's, you know, uh, what he really added was the ability to add information about um, returning your body to its, you know, optimal state where that's going to put you in a better position no matter where you are. So right. um, it was very, yeah, it was very helpful. Yeah, we call it, we like the, there's a word we use, like salutogenesis. Salute means health and genesis means the creation of. So I always say, how can we create healthier people? And um, so especially with the brain, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, research on this going all the time and it's always changing and stuff. But uh, just some of the concepts I like people to get, like electrolytes are really important. Just think of your brain like an electrical thing and, you know, currents and have to flow all of properly. So important electrolytes you know i see people coming from like a you know lemon lemon water lemon juices celery juice is the big craze right now it's helping a lot of people but there's a lot of good minerals in that and it can be very cleansing and that kind of thing and so there's a big sort of trend right now everyone thinks that the whole brain is all made out of fat a lot of the membrane the membrane is all fatty but like inside there's a lot of glycogen and glucose like the brain really has to use a lot of glucose to work so it's really important that you're supplying with good, healthy source of glucose, which would be coming from mainly from fruits, and we call them clean carbohydrates, like you know, you sweet potatoes and those kind of things. And I know a lot of that stuff is kind of vilified right now, and the you know, carbs are not good for you, but for your brain, <laughs> good carbs are good, right? There's a difference between like a processed, you know, chocolate bar and uh, you know, Mother Nature's banana or something that's got electrolytes and it's got you know, it's got amino acids and it's got all that kind of stuff that would be good, and it gets slowly into your system. We're not worried about spiking insulin stuff because it's real food real food when it's eaten properly can be beneficial for the brain and uh, you know a lot of things trying to avoid a lot of the toxins for your brain too so unfortunately some of the worst stuff would be like um, like uh, artificial air fresheners and things like that 
plastics and those kind of things. Like, I, I don't know, I can't remember the latest stats. I think we have like a credit card worth of plastic that gets into our body every, I can't remember what it is, every day, every week, every month, something like that, but it's a lot. <laughs> so over the course of a year, you know, 52 credit cards is not a good thing to have plastics and things in your brain. And then, uh, and, and then metals and things like that that might be in the environment and pollutants and things like that can be kind of, because, you know, if you get like metals into your brain that aren't supposed to be there, some researchers, like there's a guy named Christopher actually looking at Alzheimer's and brain function. And he says, you know, he's looking at autistic kids, autistic brains and Alzheimer's brains. And, you know, there's a lot of aluminum in there and things like that. So just trying to avoid that sort of, you know, um, being, you know, if you're close to like an industrial thing, try to get your air cleaned in your house and that kind of stuff, you know, just, and, uh, um, the other thing would be like um, uh, unproductive fats. So good healthy fats that you might find in like an avocado, that's great, that's fine, everything else. But like trans fats and other kind of like, uh, especially like um, industrial seed oils, very inflammatory and like that would be like, you know, co um, coconut seed, or sorry, um, cotton seed oil, um, sunflower seed oil, canola oil, some of the worst ones. So they're just a lot of, they're kind of inflammatory. I always say the oils are great when they're inside the vegetable because they're being protected by a lot of stuff. But as soon as you take it out there, it becomes volatile and it changes its shape. And you usually have to deodorize it and clean it and do all this industrial stuff that really makes it not so good for your brain, right? <laughs> so just, just try to avoid those because, you know, like we do talk about the membrane of the cells and the membrane has like that fatty layer around it and stuff. So you want the best fats in there for a good conductivity of uh, impulses and signals and those kind of things. So, you know, putting like a bad trans fat in your cell membrane is not very good because it doesn't become very fluid like it's supposed to and it can change conductivity and cause, you know, firing and things like that that aren't very good. So just trying to really stick to like these, you know, just pretend like you don't have any technology and you're out in the wilderness. What would you eat? What would you grab? What would you find? You know, try to make your diet more of that if you can. <laughs> That's kind of some of my, my hints on it. Um, and then I guess just as far as my my approach, like if somebody like with you, you came in, you did the functional neurology exam that I do on, you know, tetranose with your eyes closed and marching and all those funny tests that we do and those kind of things. And uh, some of the approaches, especially with um, the, the, the brain health, like if the right side of the brain has a weakness, the right side of the brain has a tendency to, um, we say, like cause your um, general global musculature, the, the tone of your body, it's kind of set up by the right side of your brain. So sometimes with people has a right brain weakness, they might be floppy babies, they might, you know, you pull them up and their head doesn't their, their neck muscles don't engage when you try to lift them up. There's a thing called like a head leg test or pull the sit test. So important little things that we want to check on babies as they're growing up to make sure. And if they're not there, there's little reflexes that we try to engage, try to get the, the reflex system to try to engage, activate the muscles to get some tone, especially like losing the curve in your neck, you know, people's heads going forward and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of stuff, you know, maybe make sure people can, you know, do movements, maybe you know, turn your head side to side to activate the vestibular system, which can help you integrate and cause the muscles in your neck to kind of activate, to maintain the curve in your neck. There's some important things there. And, um, you know, when I see somebody on the spectrum, we're always making sure we're looking for something called retained primitive reflexes. There's these reflexes you have as, little, as a little baby that are supposed to, when your brain gets healthy, that reflex should go away. But if it's retained, it's usually hindering activity and brain development in certain areas. So it's always kind of hindering things. So if some of those reflexes are present, you might have difficulty focusing, you might have difficulty saying, staying still, your posture, balance, and those kind of things might be off. So we would kind of, assess which primitive reflexes might be lagging and try to, uh, we call them integrate them so that your body can go switch from a, a primitive reflex to a posture reflex and have more stability and upright posture and work on balance and those kind of things. We might do stuff on one side of the body to stimulate the right side of the brain and things like that if that's where we find it. Those are some of the approaches and, and obviously we say like the, um, there's, a, there's a thing in your brain called the thalamus which you might have heard of. It's kind of like the relay center for your brain and we kind of call it like the pacemaker for the brain. So the thalamus kind of has like a sort of like a, it's sort of setting the stage for activity. And a lot of that setting the stage is uh, gravity is the only constant thing that's happening to our body. So, you know, compression and, and um, expansion in joints and we call them mechanoreceptors in your, in your spine or muscle spindles in your muscles. They're sending constant signals to your brain to know where you are in space. And so that gravity is the one constant we have because some people might not hear, they might not see, you know, they, we can take out a sense, but gravity is kind of always there, basically. And that's kind of like setting the baseline activity of your brain. And the part of your brain on the back called the cerebellum, if that's getting stimulated properly, that feeds into the thalamus, which then feeds into the whole cortex. And that's where your 
brain health can come from. So it's important that the bones in your spine move properly to stimulate your cerebellum, to push activity to your thalamus and to your prefrontal cortex, which then can hit, inhibit things properly into your body. So those are just kind of some of the global things that we look at when we're working. It might be a little complicated for some people, but that's kind of some of the stuff we look at when people are coming to see us. So any last comments there, Lucas? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a good note to end on is, uh, I guess, willpower in a sense and kind of, you know, really, I think what I learned was a lot more things are possible. You know, you have to be willing to fail um, and get comfortable being uncomfortable and, yeah. you know, trying new things and learning, especially for people with Tourette syndrome, right? They mm -hmm. may feel uncomfortable more than comfortable all the time. So uh, just getting familiar with new situations, new activities, and really understanding, you know, when once you begin to accept and, you know, I mean, basically, you know, become be comfortable with who you are and then begin pursuing growth on a long-term basis. I mean, no matter what happens, almost always the result is going to be positive. So yeah. I'd say that. Yeah. That's, that's great. So we have a few people watching, so I'm just going to open it up. If somebody might have some questions or something for us, go ahead and type in a, type in a question. We'll see if any questions come up. And uh, so we'll, uh, we'll be here for a little bit. And if no questions come up, then we'll thank everybody for being here. I wanted to kind of keep it under maybe 50 minutes, and we did that, so that was good. <clears throat> so I'm glad everyone kind of participated and came with, oh, maybe I have a question. Ali asked him a question. Dr. Marco, what would a high-functioning person with Tourette syndrome look like in comparisons to someone with low functioning? Is there a spectrum? For Tourette, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not exactly an expert on that, but like I said, every, all the spectrum disorders, I call it a spectrum because like, you know, for, for him, for example, it might just be a blink, you know, that would be like a high functioning, a blink, and <clears throat> that might be it. But then, you know, somebody that has a big challenge, they might be flailing their arm and actually, you know, doing the vocalizations. And, you know, I've seen, I've seen footage of, you know, basically she, the girl was taking like pretty much every fourth or fifth sentence, she's saying a bad word and, and flailing and moving her head, right? <laughs> so it can be really, really bad, right? So it's kind of like autism. You, you, I can have like a non-verbal floppy kid that doesn't do anything and just is sitting there. And then I can have another kid that looks totally fine and maybe just doesn't get a joke or a pun or something like that, which is on the other end, right? Everything else is okay, but they just that little social thing. So that's kind of the spectrum there. Uh, Jenna says, uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's see. All right, we'll just wait one more minute. So once again, Lucas, I want to appreciate I appreciate you, and I uh, I think you've given some great insight and some great information for people to learn. Um, let's see, I have another question from Richard now. Can you see the questions, Lucas? Yeah, yeah. Okay. With the guest condition, what is a good one or so takeaway for those of us that don't have it? What can we learn from this? Yeah. Absolutely. I think, well, I think what's universal, I mean, that makes us all human. You know, at some point in life, we all experience a challenge or a pain point or, you know, something that we'd like to improve upon. Um, whether, you know, you sprain your ankle or you're going through tough times even now, right? Um, basically utilizing the resources you have in your environment, being resourceful and really understanding like you, you know, we're all capable of doing great things um, and really focus on that. I mean, uh, if you, if you, I mean, if you looked at like my LinkedIn profile, I mean, I'm involved in quite a few activities um, and Tourette syndrome is just one part of those. And so I'd really say like what Tourette syndrome has taught me is don't be afraid to fail. Um, and yeah, like always be thankful. Those two things are gonna take you far. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and uh, like uh, there's um, one of my sort of my mentors from my past, I, I have sent some videos of his in the past to my patients is Dr. John Martini. And um, he, he does this thing called the quantum collapse process where he, uh, people kind of get polarized or they're, they're thinking, well, this is all bad, this is all bad. Like, you know, like a situation you know, like a lockdown or whatever it is, right? And he says, every situation always has a positive and a negative to it. But sometimes people just get fixated on one thing and they can't see the other side of it, but it's always there. You know, even like, uh, you know, like this, you know, it's, it's a condition. Oh, you know, some, but then, you know, you're, you're up, you're learning, you're going to write a book, you know. <laughs> so how, how bad it might be on one side, there's always positive coming out of it. And then so this might actually eventually get into somebody else's hands and might totally transform some other kid and make them say, you know what, I'm not going to take this as like a bad thing. I'm going to, and then, you know, we're, we'll have the next prime minister of Canada or something. Who knows, right? So, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, right? So it's really kind of cool. Uh, Ali, you see his comment there? 
Lucas, congrats on the book. Now as an author, what are your next goals regarding Tourette syndrome? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now that I've, uh, well, I guess, I mean, I haven't mastered it, um, but I think now that I've, you know, d had a, quite a lot of progress in the student aspect, um, I've, you know, been fortunate enough now to join as a director on the board of directors for Tourette Canada. Uh, so that's the national organization. And so now I plan to begin working towards the practitioner aspect. Um, so it actually with um, this lockdown, I've started studying for the MCAT, um, begin to, the process towards medical school application so I can become a, you know, a practicing a Tourette syndrome psychiatrist. Um, oh, and the, Richard Idols, what, what kind of doc do you want it to be? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so yeah, um, basically a psychiatrist or neurologist. Uh, the reason for that being is because uh, beyond just the medical degree, they also have five to six years of further specialization in uh, basically the brain body connection, the interaction with uh, pharmaceuticals and also just other things outside of the pharmaceuticals. Um, the brain is incredibly complex. Um, so that's kind of what I want to do um, and kind of work towards creating more information and a better understanding. Awesome. Very cool. That's good. Richie probably wants you to be a chiropractor because I'm his chiropractor. And <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's okay. Uh, well, bad news. Well, maybe that's next, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll, still, we'll still stay connected and hopefully we can you know, continue to maybe like, you know, you were talking about maybe doing some stuff together. And like I said, you know, if I could yeah. get my hands on a lot more people and do some more neurology testing and, you know, try to work on a lot of that, you know, that I'd really love to do that. So that would be good. Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, now's a perfect time to begin, uh, you know, fostering collaboration and work on next steps. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, um, like I say, I don't know everything. I just know like, a couple of few small things in a small sort of sector of stuff, right? But then, you know, people coming together, we always say it always takes a village, right? So there's a lot of different aspects, you know, from the psychological, mental, uh, life, and coaching, all that kind of stuff put together can definitely help anybody, right? So we always say bring up the help of the person and whatever they have. They're going to be a better person for it, even though they have the thing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. All right, so I think we can end it here. So I appreciate you very much, Lucas. That was great. Very informative. Thank you, Dr. Marco and Lucas. All right. So we'll say goodbye. Thanks, Lucas, for being here. Thank you. Have a good night, folks. And thank you, Dr. Caravaggio. And uh, Network Family Care Center. Oh, that's yeah. Dr. Caravaggio's yeah. practice. Great place uh, once it's open again. Right, right, right now we're in uh, quarantine, whatever, but hopefully we'll get back to normal running in a little while. So the <laughs> Network, Network Family Care Center is my uh, chiropractic office in Markham, Ontario. So you just look up Network Family Care Center, ER, spelled the, the, the American way, dot com, and that's where our website is. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank